So, good afternoon. Uh, allow me to introduce Wolfgang Ehr, who is from Bonn. He recently wrote several papers with Pavel Kropa, and uh, today he will speak about possible constraint on the validity of general relativity for strong gravitational fields. His contribution is in our proceedings. So, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much, Mik Mikhail. So, as you already mentioned, I speak about the question whether there is a possible constraint on the validity of general relativity for strong gravitational fields. So, I'm not going to present any detailed results. Instead, am I perceiving this contribution to the conference as an inspiration for open-minded thoughts and discussions. To be precise, based on an epistemological point of view on the axiomatics of general relativity, I question the axiomatic foundation of general relativity concerning the geodetic equations of motion and not concerning Einstein's field equations. Well, let's start with the equivalence principle. As it, it is stated by Will in his textbook, Theory and Experiment in Gravitational Physics. First of all, we have the weak equivalence principle. If an uncharged test body is placed at an initial event in space-time and given an initial velocity there, then its subsequent trajectory will be independent of its mass, internal structure and composition. Based on the weak equivalence principle, we then have Einstein's equivalence principle, stating that the outcome of any local non-gravitational test experiment is independent of the velocity of the freely falling apparatus and is independent of where and when in the universe it is performed. The freely falling local non-gravitational test experiment is here represented by the freely falling local Lorentz frame, in which the, the laws of special relativity are valid. And the term local uh, implies that this is true down to infinitesimal extensions. So, the word line of a force-free test particle in a Lorentz frame is given by this equation, we all know this, and transformating the coordinates to the reference frame of an observer, by this equation we arrive at the geodetic or metric equations of motion. The corresponding metric then trans transforms like this, where eta is the Monkowski metric. So, let's have a look at uh, the various tests of general relativity. On the one hand, we have precise quantitative confirmation only for weak gravitational fields, basically within the solar system. And I dare say that observations like the black holes or gravitational waves are essentially of a phenomenological character only. Let's look at some examples further to the classical tests uh, within the solar system. Let's look, for instance, at the binary pulsar, as it is mentioned here where two neutron stars are orbiting with a frequency of about seven hours 
And the masses of the two neutron stars are about 1.4 solar masses. So that gives a semi-major axis of about 2 million kilometers of this binary pulsar. So, which is six orders of magnitude larger than the corresponding Schwarzschild radius of the objects, which is about four kilometers. So, we are still dealing with weak gravitational forces. Or let's have a look at the gravitational waves. The first det detection of gravitational wave three and a half years ago, and then I think last year somewhere in combination with X-ray observations, which of course was a major step forward. But basically we know nothing about masses or anything like this. This is just a pure phenomenological observation. The same stays true for the supermassive black holes. And then, um, of course, also for the star S2 orbiting uh, Sagittarius A, which is assumed to represent the supermassive black hole in the, our galactic center. So here we have, of course, more detailed uh, observations available. But also, in this case, um, we have uh, an estimated mass of the supermassive black hole in the galactic center of about 4 million solar masses. S2 assumed, uh, is assumed to have a mass of about 15 solar masses. The, per the pericentral distance um, was uh, measured to be about 18 billion kilometers. And again, the Schwarzschild radius of the supermassive black hole in the galactic center is about one, 12 million kilometers. So we are speaking about a difference of three orders of magnitude. The distance of S2 to the galactic center compared to the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole. Um, I actually like the transfer to more, um, more familiar values. So, um, if you calculate the orbit of S, uh, if you calculate the orbit of S two, um, and then the force in the pericentral uh, distance, then it is a force of five times ten to the power of thirty seven newton. Let's transfer it to the solar system. Where do we have to place the Earth in the solar system? The Earth would have a distance of about 4,000 kilometers away from the center of the Sun. And again, this is more than 1,000 times uh, larger than the Schwarzschild radius of the Sun. So um, clearly, we still are looking at weak gravitational forces. Um, and of course, we have the Big Bang. So I'm living in the western parts of Germany, uh, in the Rhineland. And the people there, they, they have a kind of funny counting. It's um, 1, 2, 3, 25, 100,000. So I'm not quite sure whether uh, there are 25 or 100,000 open parameters uh, to uh, arrive at the cosmic microwave background or dark matter halos and so, um, yeah. So, sorry for that one. Let's get back to science. So, uh, let's get back to uh, part two of the Einstein equivalence principle. The outcome of any local non-gravitational test experiment is independent of the velocity of the freely falling apparatus. This relates to the famous thought experiment of Einstein where an observer is situated in an enclosed elevator. And because the elevator is closed, he cannot distinguish between inertial forces due to the acceleration of the ele elevator or to gravitational forces. But the gravitational field is inhomogeneous in contrast to the acceleration field, which means that if the observer would be able to measure with sufficient accuracy, he would be able to distinguish 
between the homogeneous acceleration field and the inhomogeneous gravitational field. Commonly accepted is the way out to reduce the size of the elevator down to infinitesimal small extensions and therefore we have the term local. But as a consequence we are dealing only with an approximate matrix of the freely falling local Lorentz frame. So it's not just a Minkowski metric, there is small deviations, even for small infinitesimal small sizes. So this suggests to have a look at uh, axiomatic formulations uh, within the history of physics and to me we can distinguish between uh, a priori formulations and a posteriori formulations. Let's start with an a posteriori formulation. Um, there we have an axiomatic formulation uh, ending up in mathematic equations and the relation to the measurement cap capabilities of observers come only afterwards when the, theory, when the theory makes predictions and of course then uh, uh, the, those predictions have to be measured and then the measurement cap capabilities of course play an, imp an important role. So for a priori formulations like for general relativity we have, as from the beginning, an intrinsic relation to the question what is the measurement capabilities of observers. So let's look at examples. Um, let's, for instance, look at quantum mechanics. How to get from Newton to quantum mechanics. Um, with increasing measurement capabilities um, it became clear that Newton dynamics cannot be applied to microscopic physics. But the formulation of Heisenberg's uncertainty relation is completely independent of, of the measurement capabilities of the observers. So this is an a posteriori relation therefore. And actually it is confirmed by the fact that the experiments uh, regarding Bell's inequality actually confirm that quantum mechanics is not hidden parameters. So, and as already explained, the situation is different with general relativity. There we have an a priori relation between the measurement capabilities and the formulation of the theory. So let's now get back to the Einstein equivalence principle, the third statement, that the outcome of any local non-gravitational test experiment is independent of where and when in the universe it is performed. So um, based on my discussion regarding the elevator. So I dare say with pithy words what is the concern of black holes and Big Bang and so on with regard to the measurement capabilities of this observer on Earth. I think that we have to relate it to the immediate vicinity of, of the Earth where we have comparable gravitational field strengths like in the solar system. There it works. So coming to the point, with a given size of the elevator and a given accuracy of 
measurement capabilities, there must be a limiting ceiling value for the strength of the gravitational field. Beyond this ceiling value, the observer will be able to distinguish between acceleration and gravitation. And therefore, the basis for the formulation of these geodetic equations is not given anymore. What is the possible logical consequence? As stated, there is an intrinsic restriction on the validity of general relativity regarding the strength of gravitational forces. Of course, um, general relativity is an extension and an improvement of uh, Newton's dynamics. So, let's put it like this. So it's a nice approximation for some more stronger gravitational fields as it can be handled by Newton's dynamics. So to finish my talk, I say thank you to Mikael and his team for organizing this conference under those difficult uh, this, uh, conditions. Thank you. Thank you.